happening now. Another innocent moment of confusion turned into another tragedy. This morning, a Texas cheerleader is in the ICU. Police say she was shot after mistaking which vehicle was her ride home. But we're learning about her condition and the suspect now in custody. New this morning, arrests in the mass shooting at a Sweet 16 party in Alabama. We have the latest on the investigation. Plus, the cousin of one of the victims joins us live with the impact the shooting has had on the community. And happening now, the Supreme Court holds off on making a decision about a controversial abortion pill. For now, Mifepristone still remains accessible across the country, but will that last? We're breaking down what's next for the drug. Thanks so much for starting your morning with us. I'm Zinclair Samoa. And I'm Valerie Castro. Joe and Savannah are on assignment. Those stories in just a few minutes, but we want to begin with the severe weather impacting millions of people today. This morning, people in cities across the central U.S. are surveying the damage left behind from a series of deadly storms. Two people are dead and dozens of others are injured. In Oklahoma, a storm left behind significant damage in the small town of coal, shredding homes and toppling power lines and trees. Search and rescue is underway there. And in Kansas, this video of a massive supercell structure was captured in Strong City, where a tornado was reported to have touched down. NBC News meteorologist Angie Lastman has the latest forecast. We'll get to her in just a minute. But first, let's get to the latest on the storm damage this morning. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch is in Chicago with more on that. Jesse, good morning. Communities are just starting to pick up the pieces this morning. Describe the damage that people are seeing, like in that community of coal. Yeah, Valerie and Clay, good morning. So we know that across Oklahoma, there are thousands of people without power. As you mentioned, unfortunately, this has proved to be deadly, this outbreak of severe weather. We have officials telling us at least two people have been killed, and there is the concern that that death toll may rise. Coal is about 25 miles south of Oklahoma City for context, and you can see those scenes of devastation. Uh, just tearing through that community, part of an outbreak that included more than a dozen reported tornadoes across three states, Iowa and Kansas, also seeing those reports of tornadoes. Here's part of what we're hearing from the ground so far. The town of Cole was, uh, was uh, hit significantly, uh, and there's a lot of infrastructure damage. There were some power lines, significant power lines that were down in that area, blocking state highways as well. So just gives you an idea, and obviously all of this was unfolding in the overnight hours. Now that daylight is coming back, you can imagine we're going to be learning more, and hopefully that will help first responders with their search efforts. And Jesse, I want to dig into search and rescue efforts, which we know are underway. What challenges are these first responders facing? Yeah, so what we've heard from highway patrols in Clay is that we're dealing with rural areas where there are dirt roads, and so it is not so simple to be moving through those areas. It was described as tedious by the highway patrol, so that appears to be getting in the way of a faster response. We know that there's this search ongoing for survivors. We've heard uh, of hundreds of first responders being involved, and we already know of dozens of people who have reportedly been injured. Jesse, besides Oklahoma, we know there are also reports of tornadoes in Iowa and Kansas. What's the extent of the damage there? Yeah, so the bulk of what we're hearing about is coal, Oklahoma. That's where we're getting the focus. Uh, compared to the number of reported tornadoes in Oklahoma, fewer in those other two states. And we're not out of the woods yet on severe weather. 27 million people today into tonight looking at a threat of severe storms, more large hail and tornadoes possible as these communities already hit are picking up what's left behind, guys. Jesse in Chicago, thank you so much. Time now for a check at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lassman is tracking the storms this morning. Good morning, Angie. What's the latest? The latest is we're still going to be dealing with the potential for some strong to severe storms through the day today. And we've kicked off the morning hours in a lot of spots across places like Iowa uh, in, as well as Kansas dealing with some stronger storms. Uh, not severe weather by any means, but we could see maybe some hail with this and potentially uh, we could see some strong winds as well. You see a whole lot of rain working through places like Omaha. Now we're getting a break from that. It continues moving to the east. 
east, and we've had one quick line move through portions uh, of Green Bay and Chicago. We're dry for now, but again, that rain is working your way. We're also going to deal with that uh, kind of resurgence of the energy here as we get into the, la the later part of our afternoon hours and specifically into the evening hours, too. And this is going to be centered over much of the south, stretching from places like Texas all the way up into Illinois, including major cities like St. Louis, Little Rock, uh, Waco, Dallas, Houston, all included in the potential to see some of these stronger storms. It's mainly going to be the hail that we watch for and the, the damaging winds. But of course, we can't rule out those isolated tornadoes. The tornado threat is lower today than it was yesterday. But still, like, the isolated chance for a tornado is, is still possible. Here's the areas that we're looking for the best chance to see that larger hail. We're talking tennis ball, this, this tennis ball size. We can really do some damage with uh, two plus inch hail. And that is centered over places like Waco, Austin, San Antonio, uh, and even as far north as St. Louis, Little Rock, and Shreveport, as well as Houston, you could see hail up to an inch. And of course, that damaging wind is also going to be a factor, too. The strong winds are possible for tomorrow, too, in extending along the Gulf Coast, New Orleans, Mobile, Corpus Christi, all included in that. Uh, it's a marginal risk. So what that means is it's a little lower than what we're dealing with today, but it's not zero. So we will keep a close eye on that. It's all part of this storm system that's stretching from the northern plains and bringing folks there snow and accumulating snow at that. And it'll eventually start to work some of that rain into the mid-Atlantic and the northeast and up and down really the east coast as we get into Saturday. It'll be a little bit of a soggy one for folks there, but heavy rain expected for places like Austin, Lake Charles, Little Rock, and Memphis. These areas that are already uh, quite saturated, guys, will watch for the flash flooding concern uh, as well as that snowfall happening in portions of the northern plains. All right, umbrella season and snow boots in some places. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spring. <laughs> Angie Lazar. A little of everything. Yeah, thank you. Now to Texas, where an 18-year-old is in critical condition this morning after being shot. The teen, one of two cheerleaders, shot after a third friend mistakenly tried to get into the wrong car at a supermarket parking lot. Police arrested the shooting suspect, who's now in jail, charged with en engaging in deadly conduct. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck is in Austin with the story. Well, Peyton Washington was just days away from the biggest cheerleading competition of the year. Her father actually telling NBC News she was wearing her cheerleading uniform when she was shot. Now, instead of joining her teammates in Orlando for the competition this weekend, she'll be recovering here in the intensive care unit. In Texas, a high school cheerleader is in critical condition this morning. After police say a man fired a gun at her and three teammates who accidentally approached the wrong car following a late night practice. The girls are going to have a long road of emotional recovery after this. Authorities arrested Pedro Tello Rodriguez Jr., charging him with deadly conduct, a third degree felony. I'm Peyton Washington on Woodlands Elite Generals. Peyton Washington is one of two teens who were shot and injured in a supermarket parking lot early Tuesday morning. Washington's father speaking out, telling NBC News the shooter showed his weapon and then, quote, just started shooting at the girls. Keelan Washington adding, you watched her walk up to your door on accident. It's a girl in a cheer outfit. He says the 18-year-old who was struck in her leg and back had to have her spleen removed. Peyton, who's no stranger to health challenges, having been born with one lung, earned a tumbling scholarship at Baylor University. She's extremely tough. Washington's teammate, Heather Roth, was grazed by a bullet in her leg, but is expected to compete this weekend in her final high school cheer competition. Tuesday's shooting in Texas, one of several making national headlines this week of young people injured or even killed for mistakenly being in the wrong place. In upstate New York, 20-year-old Kaylin Gillis was shot and killed after she turned into the wrong driveway while looking for a friend's house, according to the police. Kaylin was an amazing young lady. We all loved her so much. She was so kind. The alleged gunman, Kevin Monahan was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. He's pleaded not guilty. Gillis's father pleading for justice for his daughter, who he says dreamed of becoming a marine biologist. For this man to sit on his porch and fire at a car with no threat just angers me so badly. The Woodland Elite Cheer Team has set up a GoFundMe page to help with Peyton's medical expenses. So far, it's raised more than $100,000. Back to you. Katie Beck, thanks so much.
Now to Alabama, where three people are facing charges in that deadly shooting at a Sweet 16 party over the weekend. Wilson Hill Jr. and two teenage brothers, Tyreek and Travis McCullough, are all facing four counts of reckless murder. Authorities say more charges are likely to follow. Four people were killed in the shooting, including Kiki Smith. For more, we are joined by Kiki's cousin, Amy Jackson. Amy, I want to thank you for being here. I am so very sorry for your loss. No one should have to go through what you have gone through. So I just want to first ask, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Yeah. I mean, I know these arrests, there's no form of justice if these lives are gone. But what's your reaction to them? I really don't know how to react. I'm still angry. My family's still angry. We, I'm just speechless right now at the moment. Yeah, no, and I know grief is so layered and I thank you for making time to speak to us. I'm sure this is so raw because this was supposed to be a moment of celebration interrupted by violence. And so yes. obviously investigators are saying that they're still in the early phases of this investigation. So far, though, they have not released a possible motive for the shooting. What is the community saying? I know it's been described as tight-knit there in Dadeville. It is. The community, really, we're focusing on the, the four victims that lost their lives, and we're also focusing on the 32 that was injured. That's some still in the hospital, some is at home. Um, it really has affected the whole community, the family. Um, everybody world stopped on Saturday night, and now we're just really picking up the pieces to try to, to figure it out, want to know why. It's a lot of whys, you know, mm -hmm. with no answers. Yeah. Where were you when you got the news? I was at home here in Mobile when I got the news. Did you believe it? And it was Sunday, early Sunday, Sunday morning. Did I what? Did you believe it? No, no. I would have never thought in in my lifetime that I would have something like this in my small town would, would have a mass shooting. Yeah. I mean, your cousin's life is gone, but her memory can remain. What do you want people to know about who she was? Um, Kiki, she was, she was, just a whole big ball of love. She showed it. She um, she was such a caretaker. She was a good daughter. She I've said this before, and um, she was just a respectable young lady that her her young siblings really looked up to her. Yeah, and I mean, Amy, you said a question that's been on your mind is why, 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 and this is happening in the context of too many shootings in this country, especially this week. What action do you want to see from lawmakers? Is there something tangible you're asking for? Well, my thing, I want to know how is it these guns are so readily available when people need it to do these mean acts? They sh it should be some kind of way. I know most of them may get them black market or whatever, but it, it shouldn't be. These guns are just readily available to people and they could just pick up one and go do the act without even thinking. It's just like you picking up your purse, getting in a car and driving off. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a demand many families have been asking for. And so, Amy, I just hope that as you continue to grieve and heal, um, that you'll find some peace in this. I'm so sorry again for your loss. Thank you so much for joining us, Amy Jackson. Now to new details on the Kansas City shooting of teenager Ralph Yarl. The 84-year-old man accused of shooting him has pleaded not guilty. Andrew Lester, a white man, is facing two felony charges after allegedly firing two shots at the black teen. Yarl's family says he accidentally rang Lester's doorbell while picking up his siblings. The teen was shot in the head and the arm. The family's lawyer is now calling for a federal investigation into a possible hate crime. Lester is scheduled to return to court in June. And the family of Tyree Nichols has announced they're filing a $550 million lawsuit against the city of Memphis and its police department. Nichols, a black man, was beaten by Memphis police officers after a traffic stop in January. Following the incident, he was taken to the hospital 
and three days later, he was pronounced dead. Five officers are charged with second-degree murder. They have pleaded not guilty. This new lawsuit alleges the fatal beating was the product of, quote, unconstitutional policies, practices, customs, and deliberate indifference of the city of Memphis. Attorneys for the family say the aim of the lawsuit is to rid communities of oppressive police units like the now disbanded Scorpion Unit. The five officers charged in Nichols' death were members of that Scorpion unit. The city of Memphis and the Memphis Police Department declined to comment on the lawsuit. We want to turn now to the major legal battle that could shape abortion rights in the United States. The Supreme Court has extended nationwide access to abortion pills for another two days. Justice Samuel Alito released the one-sentence ruling yesterday, giving the court until midnight on Friday to make a decision. So to dig in more on this, we've got Kristen gibbons Fedden joining us now. She's a civil rights attorney and former prosecutor. Kristen, good morning. So first, what are some of the options here for the Supreme Court? Is it possible that this case ends up kicked down back to the the circuit of appeals. Yeah, you know, the Supreme Court faces several options um, in this case. They could decide to uphold the lower court's ruling, which would invalidate the FDA's approval of Mifepristone and create really a significant obstacle for women seeking the drug. On the other hand, they could reverse the lower court's decision, which would preserve the FDA's approval um, and maintain the drug's availability on the market, or they could allow the Fifth Circuit's order to go into effect, complicating the legal environment, allowing the drug to remain on the markets, but really severely restricting access to it. I guess they could also extend the pause and take up the case on an expedited basis and actually hear oral arguments to make a more definitive ruling on the issues. And that would really surround the FDA's approval of the abortion drug and its availability. What do you see transpiring among the justices between now and tomorrow? How do they approach situations like this? Yeah, so the justices are going to do like any judge would do. They're going to review the materials. They're going to review the legal briefs, the arguments. Um, and most importantly, they're really going to engage in hefty internal discussions and debates and really try to reach a consensus. You know, based on the ideological composition of the court and the highly sensitive matter in this case, it's reasonable to expect there's going to be some disagreement, which is potentially why they extended their deadline um, to Friday. Um, but I think one of the things that's important to note um, is that even though they extended the deadline to Friday, they really could release a decision at any point. Could be today, could be in the next hour, or it could be before midnight on Friday. And Kristen, I do want to look at the big picture here, because is it common for the Supreme Court to make decisions this way? How uncertain is what some call the shadow docket when it comes, um, or excuse me, how uncertain is the shadow docket and are they on a deadline to act? You know, it's actually not entirely uncommon. Um, it's not unusual for the court to issue temporary stays, extensions or pauses in cases specifically like this where there are significant legal issues being debated um, and where there really is a potential for immediate and widespread con consequences. Um, and in part, particularly in this case, you know, the court is now dealing with a major abortion-related case post the Dobbs decision. So it's going to be really important for them to exercise their role to make a conscientious decision. All right, important analysis. Kristen Gibbons fed in. Thank you so much. Now to our climate challenge series and how it's putting the gentle giants of the Atlantic Ocean at risk. Right whales got their name centuries ago because they were right to hunt. These majestic creatures are now in a very rough situation. Since 2017, the federal government has declared them an endangered species, but there are hopeful solutions. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson has this report from Cape Cod Bay. In the spring, the waters in the crook of Cape Cod's arm are a playground for North Atlantic right whales. Wow! They've got five whales here. Awesome. Now okay. researchers from the Center for Coastal Studies document the conditions of some of the most endangered creatures in the world. Yeah. How often do you see right whales? Um, rarely. Camouflaged by nature to blend into the sea, their numbers peaked at around 483 in 2010. Today, there are fewer than 340. What's the goal of all this? The goal? Um, well, the goal is to conserve the species, not let them go extinct, not let us make them go extinct. These right whales are huge, up to 55 feet long, the size of a school bus. But they swim very slowly, just six miles an hour. 
that slow speed puts them on a potentially deadly collision course with boats carrying all the stuff we order. The whales migrate 2,000 miles up and down the East Coast, traveling the same route as cargo ships, now bigger and heavier. The whales must also navigate a maze of vertical fishing lines that can entangle them. I think it's then there's climate change, warming waters impacting their food supply. Researcher yeah. Christy Huda. The right whales are always following where their food is. And uh, now their food is shifting because of the warm water. Does that put them more in danger of vessels and fishermen? Unfortunately, that's true. NOAA's instituted mandatory seasonal slow zones and temporary fishing bans when whales are present. But critics say ship speed limits are not being enforced. Oceana's analysis has found that up and down the East Coast, from port to port, we're finding too many speeding vessels to protect the right whales. Oceana points to this whale killed by a vessel strike last February near Virginia Beach. In a statement, NOAA says it's aware of Oceana's analysis, but says most boats obey the limits, citing 78% compliance in the waters where the whale was found. Back in Cape Cod, a sign of hope. Is that a cat? Yes, it is. One of 11 to survive this year. Numbers that must grow for this species to rebound. Ann Thompson, NBC News, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Our thanks to Ann for that. And coming up, the latest on a deadly stampede in Yemen. Crowds were crushed as thousands were in line for aid. What we're learning about the incident that's already killed nearly 100 people. Also this morning, Congress is taking new steps to address cannabis reform. What this means for the efforts to get recreational marijuana legalized at the federal level later this hour. We're back with the latest on that horrifying stampede in Yemen that's left at least 78 people dead and dozens injured. The tragedy happened yesterday in the capital, Sana'a. Hundreds had gathered to receive donations at a charitable distribution event marking the holy month of Ramadan. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer joins us now for more on this. Janice, this is such a devastating incident for a country that's already in the midst of a war and a humanitarian crisis. Walk us through how this tragedy unfolded and the reaction on the ground. Well, a crowd had gathered for a charity event uh, for Ramadan where small cash donations, less than $10, were being handed out by this charity funded by local businessmen. And armed rebels who controlled the city, Sana'a, were doing crowd control. And they fired their guns into the air, which triggered an electrical explosion. And people panicked. Uh, a surge became a stampede. Video posted to social media shows this horrible scene where people are screaming. Some are lying motionless. Others are struggling to help. The latest toll, uh, according to officials, at least 78 people are dead. That number is expected to rise. Uh, many of the victims were crushed, and there are scores who are still injured. Those images are, are just devastating. We understand there is an investigation underway. What can you tell us about that? Well, officials are, some of them are already blaming the, the charity for poor coordination in handing out the donations. But the prime minister has said that there will be an investigation to ensure something like this doesn't happen again. They're going to pay compensation uh, to the families of the, of the victims and those who are still in hospital. Um, the incident is considered one of the deadliest in Yemen in years. That's not directly related to the long-running civil war there, which has made Yemen the world's worst humanitarian disaster. Uh, you know, the scale of need there is staggering. There are millions of people who are vulnerable, and that this has happened uh, just ahead of the Eid al-Fitr, which is the Muslim holiday that marks the end of Ramadan, which is later this week, makes this all the more tragic. Right, Janice, those images are just terrifying. Thank you so much. Now to a warning from the man who runs the Pentagon's program investigating unexplained aerial phenomena. That's what most of us call UFOs. And while many may just be balloons, it appears some may also be advanced Chinese or Russian vehicles. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has the story. Whatever they are, 
There's a whole fleet of them. They seem to defy the rules of physics, hovering, stopping on a dime, moving at hypersonic speeds. What was splashed? Splashed. splashed. The man in charge of investigating UAPs said his office now has 650 reports. More than half have a round or sphere shape, possibly balloons, typically white, translucent, or metallic. Observed at 10 to 30,000 feet. So far, no sign of alien involvement. No credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity. Sean Kirkpatrick says this case remains unresolved. A cylinder object spotted somewhere in the Middle East. But this flying object with a tail, he says, turns out to be a plane. This is the heat signature off of the engines of a commuter aircraft that happened to be flying in the vicinity. More concerning, Russia or China could have advanced capabilities the U.S. doesn't have. Could you describe potential threat that might exist out there if they are foreign. Are there capabilities that could be employed against us? Absolutely. Two months after U.S. fighters shot a Chinese spy balloon out of the sky, the Washington Post reports leaked intelligence documents not verified by NBC News suggest China could soon deploy a high-altitude spy drone able to travel at three times the speed of sound and able to surveil and attack American targets. The adversary is not waiting. They are advancing and they're advancing quickly. The Pentagon's UAP office has been open only nine months. Three dozen experts trying to determine what's a threat and what's not. Tom, thanks so much. And coming up, it's being called the threat within. A new report on the state of black America is sounding the alarm about the threat to racial justice from extremist ideology. We'll break down the findings next on Morning News Now. Now to a leaked Zoom recording that turned into a PR disaster. The CEO of a designer furniture company telling her employees to focus on company earning goals instead of their bonuses. Many are calling the move cold and hypocritical. A CEO getting slammed after her tone deaf comments about staff pay in a virtual town hall were leaked. I had an old boss who said to me one time, you can visit Pity City, but you can't live there. So people leave pity cd let's get it done andy owen the president and ceo of miller knoll a high-end furniture company whose brands include herman miller and design within reach addressing employee concerns about a lack of bonuses questions came through about how can we stay motivated if we're not going to get a bonus some of them were nice and some of them were not so nice but critics pointing out the not so nice way she apparently tried to motivate workers after the company's sales in the latest quarter took a hit she said to focus on reaching corporate performance targets. Get the damn $26 million. Spend your time and your effort thinking about the $26 million we need and not thinking about what you're going to do if we don't get a bonus. All right. NBC has only seen the excerpt of the video clip circulating on social media and not the full meeting. But observers highlighting Owen's additional compensation in 2022, according to SEC filings, nearly $4 million in stock options, awards and more on top of her $1.1 million salary. One podcaster unleashing in a live stream. She now is really just saying, I don't give a f about any of you just go out there and get the 26 million dollars that we need so i can get my bonus and we can be profitable and don't complain about it social media lighting up the irony this woman is saying lead by example yeah and she managed to find some way to give herself a bonus and a healthy compensation package nbc news reached out to miller knoll and owen and did not hear back but in a statement to npr the company saying the video clip was quote taken out of context and struck a nerve and andy is confident in the team and our collective potential an internal communications email obtained by nbc news from two verified miller knoll employees details an apparent apology by owen saying in part quote Quote, I try to always pick the right words and tone to inspire and motivate, adding, I feel terrible that my rallying cry seemed insensitive. Whatever the intention behind what was meant to be an inspiring speech, Owen signing off with this. Let's get it done. Thank you. Have a great day. 
We did not hear back from the company, but a spokesperson tells the Holland Sentinel, that's a local paper in Michigan where the company is based and part of the USA Today network, that bonuses haven't been decided yet because the company's fiscal year doesn't end until May. That also applies for any additional compensation the CEO could potentially get. Coming up, a budding industry. Today, lawmakers and business leaders coming together to discuss cannabis reform. After the break, we take you to Capitol Hill for more on their joint effort. And more travelers are thinking green. How to make your next vacation more environmentally friendly. This is Morning News Now. Today is 420, the unofficial marijuana holiday, and lawmakers on Capitol Hill are marking the day by addressing cannabis reform. They're holding the National Cannabis Policy Summit with business leaders and marijuana advocates. They're expected to cover several issues, including expungement, social equity, and paths to federal legislation. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us now with more on this. Julie, this event on cannabis policy really reflects, reflects the growing support for national reforms across the country and in Congress. What are we expecting from today's event? Yeah, good morning, Valerie. Look, this is going to be a big deal. About 10 lawmakers on both sides of the aisle from all over the ecological spectrum and all over the nation are going to come together in this summit, joining business leaders, advocates of cannabis reform in discussing different buckets, different areas like the ones you mentioned there's going to be some different panels going on, including uh, one with a new generation of conservatives, for example, featuring Nancy Mace and Brian Mast. Mast, by the way, of Florida, he's a veteran. He's pushing for cannabis reform for veterans specifically. You have others, uh, including Jeff Merkley, the senator who is pushing for safe banking reforms and how marijuana legal businesses are able to bank with federal banks. Now they're unable to do so because it's illegal on a national level. But the big picture here is that this is a big deal. The event is going to conclude with remarks from the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer. They're all going to come together and talk about how to move forward and how Congress can come together to pass any kind of cannabis reforms that would be meaningful, not just to the marijuana contributing community, uh, but also to the nation as a whole, because obviously there are still a lot of people who are uh, incarcerated because of this. So this is a criminal justice issue as well and an equity one, too. So we're going to hear a lot of the those themes echo today. And Julie, this event is a sign of progress, right? But with a divided Congress, what are the chances that some sort of comprehensive legalization of marijuana could happen this session? Yeah, Valerie, it's a good question. I was talking to advocates who are up on Capitol Hill nearly every day trying to meet with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to try to make this happen. Some of them expected this to happen years ago. They think this is already too late. We have 21 states, including the District of Columbia, who are uh, who have legal recreational marijuana, 37 states at least who have medical use. So uh, advocates say it's past time for Congress to come together and deschedule the drug. Right now, it's still a Schedule One drug, which uh, incapitates a lot of businesses, even in legal states, from being able to uh, function and operate properly and effectively. It's in the same category still as heroin and cocaine. These drugs uh, that are obviously more illicit than marijuana have more illicit effects, uh, but still legal uh, federal legalization on that level is needed for it to be descheduled. Right now, that's not looking likely. They're looking at smaller reforms, including safe banking, which would uh, create a portal for federal banks to be able to work with legal marijuana businesses that will aid a lot of problems they currently have. Julie, you mentioned this is a criminal justice issue as well. President Biden granted a mass pardon last year for people who've committed federal cannabis possession offenses. What is the latest on that process? Yeah, last month they actually officially opened the portal for folks to be able to apply to have their records expunged. This is for folks who have small possession of marijuana only at the federal level or in the District of Columbia. So this does not apply to people at the state level, though that is something President Biden urged governors to look at uh, and take on. Um, I should note, like I said, nearly half the country has already legalized some sort of marijuana, whether medically or recreationally. So there is not a lot of cases that this would apply to, but still about 6,500 people could be affected by this pardon. Advocates, though, say they want the president to do more, but there's not much he can do without Congress's help. Okay, Julie, thank you so much for updating us. We appreciate it. 
It may be hard to believe, but the summer travel season kicks off less than six weeks from now. Yeah, I'm excited and more and more people want to book eco-friendly trips as the sustainable travel market goes mainstream. For more on this, we're joined by Jesse Ashlock, who's the Deputy Global Editorial Director for Condé Nast Travel. Jesse, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Explain to us what it means to travel eco-friendly. What does that entail and how can we all think about this when we're booking our trips? Good morning. Thanks for having me and happy almost Earth Day. Um, it's really important, I think, in this day and age for travelers to take into account the social impact as well as the environmental impact of the hotels and destinations they're visiting. I think at this point, everybody should be trying to phase out single use plastics, right? Um, but what are they doing to raise up the surrounding community in terms of employment, education, conservation, other kinds of social programs? Um, I was recently at this wonderful eco resort in, in Costa, Rica, Costa Rica called Nayara, which has recently become carbon neutral, but also importantly, about 98% of its staff is, um, is from the local La Fortuna community. Um, and that's really, really important. Another really good example of this is African Bush Camps, which is a collection of um, owner-operated safari lodges in Africa, which only employ local naturalists to be their guides. So these are people with deep, deep connections to their communities and deep knowledge of Africa. Um, also, as far as the plastics go, one more thing on that, I, I think it's also important that hotels are asking their suppliers not to use them. And a really good example of this is the wonderful young um, hotel brand Habitas, which doesn't have single-use plastics in their hotels or with any of their vendors. And Jesse, I've heard it said that sustainable travel could be a bit of an oxymoron, right? Traveling in an airplane emits a lot of carbon, but there are ways you can offset that, right? Can you talk to us about that? You can purchase carbon offsets. You can also think about how often you travel and how long you travel. And um, and slow travel is an emerging trend in the travel universe. People going uh, to places for longer periods of time and going deeper, which also has the benefit of allowing for a more immersive and authentic encounter with a community. Um, I also think it's important to keep in mind that um, you know, global emissions from air travel is less than 3% of the total problem, and leisure travel is a small percentage of that. And without leisure travel, a lot of economies around the world that are heavily reliant on tourism might instead turn to terrible extractive industries that have a really de deleterious impact uh, on the world. Okay, Jesse Ashlock, thanks so much for the information. We appreciate it. Thank you. And later this morning, President Biden will speak at a virtual meeting of the Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate Change. The president expected to highlight what his administration is doing to tackle the climate crisis. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now for more on this. Ali, good morning. So first off, can you just explain to us what exactly this forum is all about and who's involved? Yeah, Zinclair, good morning. Well, climate change policy has been a huge priority for the Biden administration, and we're going to see that continue on full display today. We know that President Biden, for the fourth time, actually, during his presidency, will convene with climate leaders uh, from several different countries during uh, this major economies forum on energy and climate. Uh, we don't have a full guest, uh, guest list from the White House, but we do know that some of the major participants this morning will be the head of the international Energy Agency, as well as President uh, Lula of Brazil, who we know has been working with the Biden administration uh, on several issues, including climate change, Sinclair. And Ali, I know you're no fortune teller, but do you have any insight into what the president is expected to say in his remarks? What kind of climate initiatives is the administration working on? Yeah, we're expecting several uh, announcement, uh, announcements of different initiatives today. Uh, one of them is going to be a $1 billion investment in the Green Climate Fund uh, to drive down emissions in the power and transportation sectors. That's something we've seen President Biden uh, go around the country to talk about during his Invest in America tour recently. And we also expect him to call on other countries like the UK, Australia, uh, Canada, Japan to also uh, join in on this goal, this initiative of making sure uh, electric vehicles make up at least 50 percent of car sales by the year 2030. We also expect President Biden to announce new steps uh, to better manage U.S. forests, as well as uh, announce a $500 million request over the next five years uh, to support anti-deforestation efforts in Brazil. That is something uh, that we know would make the U.S. one of the largest donors to the Global Amazon Fund, but we know that requests 
using that money uh, requires congressional approval. So it's going to be interesting to see how this works out, of course, given uh, the slim majority that Democrats have in the Senate and the slim majority uh, that Republicans have in the House, uh, you know, that congressional approval required to get that money. Uh, but the White House and this president well aware of the difficulty in getting that passing clay. All eyes on this one. Ali Rafa, thank you. And now we're going to take it the issues challenging communities of color as the National Urban League releases their annual State of Black America report. This year's report is titled Democracy in Peril, Confronting the Threat Within, and is sounding the alarm on the extremist ideology taking root in our major institutions everywhere from the nation's classroom to Congress. Joining us now to dig in is Mark Morial. He's the president and CEO of the National Urban League. Mark, good morning. Thank you for being here. So hey, let's... Thanks. Having me. Of course. I want to dig into the State of Black America report, noting that, of course, no community is a monolith. But what exactly is the report designed to show? Can you just walk us through this year's findings? I think, specifically, yeah. so go I, for I'm it. so glad to be able to speak to you all. It's designed to show that this rise in extremism and hate crimes, and hate crimes are at the highest level, the violence-induced politics we see in America today uh, the extreme attacks on democracy through voter suppression, now the attacks on the teaching of black history, the censorship of books, uh, that extremism as an ideology is not impacting lawmaking. It's impacting legislating. It's now becoming much more mainstream. It's always been there, but it's sort of operated on the fringes uh, of American politics. Now it's intruded into the mainstream, and this is a threat to democracy, not only for black Americans, but for the entire nation. Uh, just look at the states uh, on the map uh, that have quote unquote banned critical race theory. They're really banning the teaching of the truth. They're really banning the teaching of black history. They're really banning the teaching of the nation's uh, history when it comes to race. However painful history is, we must learn it truthfully and accurately. And Mark, this might be surprising to some people, but climate change got its very own section in this year's report. Tell us more about that. So, yes, and I appreciate that, because the ideology of hate and extremism uh, says that we shouldn't pursue renewable energy futures. Uh, it uh, traffics in conspiracy theories and untruths that human beings and human behavior has had no impact on the deterioration of our climate, then we have to reject that. But what we seek to do with this report is tie together to, if you will, help people understand that hate and extremism is impacting important decisions that are made in the Congress. Uh, it is influencing legislators. It is influencing school board members. Uh, and that we've got to push back against it. Now, what excites me is that there is a large coalition of people a uh, large coalition of people who recognize the threat to democracy and work every single day to protect it. Congress could do its role to protect American democracy by passing the John Lewis bill. Uh, it would stop voter suppression in its tracks. Uh, it would create a level and neutral, if you will, playing field when it comes to how we redistrict, how we reapportion, and the voting systems across the nation. So, so mm. there is work to be done, but hate and extremism is negatively impacting black America yeah. and the entire nation. And Mark, I mean, you talked about Congress, lawmakers. When we look at leadership in our country, it strikes me that the report is being released at a time when President Joe Biden's cabinet is being touted as the most diverse in U.S. history. What exactly does that tell you about the future of the country and the state of the country today, briefly here. I applaud that. And we worked hard. Uh, we challenged the president, and he took up the challenge, and he kept his word in building this highly diverse cabinet. And I think what it shows is that while there is a movement for hate in the country, there's also another movement. And that's a movement for uh, tolerance, reconciliation. It's about cooperation. It's about inclusion. Is it about diversity and equity? Yes, it is, because that's the future. That's where the American people are. 60% plus of the American people support an alternative vision to this campaign loud of hate and extremism. And that's what we've got to recognize. We've got to recognize this is not a moment for despair. 
This is a moment for us to embrace the values and principles, and that is what the state of black America is all about, the values and principles of, uh, of diversity, of justice, of true freedom, freedom to learn, the freedom to vote, uh, the freedom to, for my talents, to, to basically be able to be completely fulfilled. Mm, really important analysis there, Mark Morial. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. Now let's turn and talk money and dig into what's making financial headlines. Tesla shares are trending down as the company reveals its drop in profits over the last year. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us now with more. Good morning, Silvana. Valerie Zinkley, good morning. Yeah, so shares of Tesla are under pressure today, and this because the electric maker is feeling the pain of a wave of price cuts this year, which weighed on quarterly profits. Tesla has cut prices up to 25% as it deals with weaker demand, higher interest rates, new federal rules on tax credits, and increasing competition. Tesla models sold for an average of about $46,000 in the first quarter. That's down from more than $52,000 a year ago. Facebook owes us $725 million. And here's how to get your cut. Meta Platforms agreed to pay that amount to settle a class action lawsuit accusing it of giving political consulting firm Cambridge Analytica and others access to private user data. Any U.S. Facebook users who had an active account between May 24th, 2007 and December 22nd, 2022 may be eligible to receive a portion of that settlement. And you can submit a claim online at FacebookUserPrivacySettlement.com by August 25th. An overwhelming majority of Gen Z workers say that they would quit their jobs to work elsewhere if their values are more closely aligned with a new employer. A survey by LinkedIn finds 87% of Gen Zers say values could be a deal breaker and more than half say a pay raise wouldn't be enough to convince them to stay. LinkedIn says the pandemic prompted people to question where, why and how they work. Companies have been responding to job seekers changing priorities by increasing the number of postings that mention just that values. They're calling it a workers economy and it they sounds are. like that's the real that's thing. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Silvana, thank you so much. You got it. And coming up, get your popcorn ready. The summer is expected to be a big one for the big screen. Up next, we'll talk about the trends that are bringing the crowds back to movie theaters. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. The sky turned dark and the stars came out in the middle of the day in Western Australia. Earlier today, thousands gathered in a small Australian town to watch a rare solar eclipse that occurs only a handful of times per century. People camped in tents ahead of the eclipse, which only lasted a minute. Tourists and scientists cheered as the temperature dropped and the sky turned dark, many calling it a mind-blowing experience, while others said it felt like a dream. The last hybrid solar eclipse was in November 2013. NASA expects the next in about 10 years. Ooh, I remember looking at that one, but not looking directly because you don't want to. I know, you right? And you need the special eclipse. glasses. And you need everything. the special yeah. glasses. So now let's turn from the sun to the screen. The summer blockbuster season is just around the corner, and more of us are planning to catch the big movies at a theater. That's according to a new study by Fandango, which found more Americans are returning to cinemas. Okay. Eric Davis is the managing editor at Fandango and joins us now with more. Good morning, Eric. So let's just jump in here. In this age of streaming and on demand, what are some of the reasons that people gave for still wanting to see films on the big screen? And do you think this is going to be enough to actually save movie theaters after a rough few years with COVID? Without a doubt, we're, sa we're saving movie theaters this summer. You know, we surveyed over 6,000 Fandango ticket buyers for this survey. And really what we saw overwhelmingly, everyone is going to the movies. 86% of people want to see more movies than they saw last summer. 81% are going to see more than three movies in theaters this summer. Uh, and, you know, 89% saying that they're more excited about this summer than they have been in previous years. And so a stacked lineup uh, coming out, some of those movies still held over uh, and delayed from COVID. Uh, so really, you just have a lineup of films that, that people are excited about. And keep in mind, most of these people subscribe to streaming services. Uh, and so, but they're not saying, I want to watch these movies at home. They're saying the biggest movies deserve to be seen on the biggest screen. And of course, going to the movie goes hand in hand with grabbing some snacks. Concessions are on the list. As a matter of fact, your survey found 94% of us are hitting the snack bar on our way into the theater. So what are the most popular snacks? 
Well, it's always popcorn. I think I like popcorn is always it's popcorn and like Coke is usually the ones that that most people go for. But what we're seeing a lot of is the combinations. You know, people are looking at sweet and salty. So maybe they're getting popcorn and they're dropping milk duds in there. Uh, also, there's premium food now available at a lot of theaters. So you see like full meals, burgers, chicken fingers. My family loves the mozzarella sticks. And so, you know, I think just having that variety of options just adds to the experience, as well as the premium large formats, your IMAX. IMAX is breaking records right now uh, in, in Super Mario Brothers and Creed 3. So people want to see these films on the biggest screens they possibly can, and they want to have their options in terms of food and variety. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Super Mario, and as we said earlier, summer blocker, excuse, excuse me, summer blockbuster season is almost here. So what are some of the biggest films that are getting a lot of buzz? Yeah, so we did a, a survey, the top 15 most anticipated movies. Uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, interestingly, is at number one. Uh, and that's, I looked all the way back it, from our previous surveys, and that may be the first time an animated movie has ever led uh, the, our survey for summer movie season, but it's not any animated movie. The first installment won an Oscar for best animated feature, but a lot of franchises. Tom Cruise is back with a new Mission Impossible movie. That's number two. Uh, the Flash, a DC comic book movie that brings Michael Keaton back as Batman. Uh, that's number three. There's a tra Transformers movie that's set in Brooklyn. Shout out to all my New Yorkers out there. That's at number four. And Little Mermaid has a live action film that I'm personally very much looking forward to. That's at number five. So a lot of franchises, a lot of film uh, film familiar characters returning, but uh, really exciting films and, and films that people uh, are looking forward to. Yeah, a lot of nostalgia. I know I'm going to be sitting in the theater for a few of those. It would be excited. nice to cool down in the theater, too. Yeah, no, especially <laughs> with that summer heat. Oh, my goodness. Eric Davis, thank you so much. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Good Thursday morning. I'm Zinkley Asamoah. And I'm Valerie Castro in for Joe and Savannah. Right now on Morning News Now, we've got our eye on some wicked weather that's ripping across middle America this morning. Overnight, multiple tornadoes shredded communities in Oklahoma, killing at least two people. And as the sun rises, more severe storms passing over the Midwest and headed east. Our meteorologist Angie Lastman has the latest track. We're also following a crisis of violence across the country this morning after three recent high-profile shootings rocked several communities and stirred outrage nationwide over their seemingly harmless circumstances. For this man to sit on his porch and fire at a car with no threat angers me so badly. We've got the latest on the victims' conditions this morning, plus what's next for the men who police say pulled the triggers. Is the truth out there? Amid a recent surge in UFO sightings, a top Pentagon official on Capitol Hill yesterday testifying on hundreds of out-of-this-world incidents that are now under federal investigation. But should you really believe in aliens? Well, maybe don't get your hopes up. Also this morning, it's shaping up to be another bummer summer at airports nationwide with airlines and aviation officials expecting even more packed planes and schedule cuts over the next few months. So what's behind the madness and how can you best prepare for your vacation? We've got you covered. And American Pot Story, let's not beat around the bud, it's 420. Later in the hour, we'll bring you the story of the cannabis revolution here in the U.S., a grassroots group of activists in California who brought pot to politics. A lot of puns there. Yes, <laughs> we love it. <laughs> we begin this morning with another round of deadly storms tearing through parts of the central U.S. last night. Yeah, two people are dead and dozens more injured after tornadoes and strong storms caused widespread damage, leaving a small town south of Oklahoma City ravaged in just minutes. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch is in Chicago with the latest. Valerie and Zinclay, good morning. In Oklahoma alone, thousands without power. Officials reporting at least two people killed following more than a dozen reported twisters in multiple states. I think we got a tornado right there. There's a tornado. 
Oh, it's getting bigger. Overnight, reports of multiple tornadoes ripping through the middle of the country. Massive tornado. Roughly 25 miles outside Oklahoma City, homes and structures in the small town of Cole were shredded in just minutes. Complete chaos. You know, we walked outside, trees everywhere. There's metal everywhere. Just everything's, you know, just destroyed. Dozens were injured, and hundreds of first responders have been searching for survivors, worried the number of deaths may rise. It is reasonable to expect possibly more based on the damage that we've seen. In Shawnee, Oklahoma, nightfall bringing more fear and extensive damage. This is a violent, large circulation here, and it could produce a large, violent tornado. Students at Oklahoma Baptist University seeking shelter and returning to chaos. Well, like the mattresses like just flew everywhere. I went back to check on my room when we got released. There's glass everywhere. My window is gone. My room is a whole mess. The National Weather Service issued tornado and severe thunderstorm warnings in Oklahoma, Iowa, and Kansas, where a reported twister touched down in Strong City. All right, we got a tornado. Relentless winds toppled trees and knocked out power for more than 20,000 customers throughout Oklahoma. Massive hail pummeling the ground. Another spring storm leaving tragedy and destruction in its wake. This is really the worst storm that this town has ever seen. Today into tonight, 27 million at risk of severe weather with more large hail and a few tornadoes possible as communities already hit pick up what's left. Valerie and Clay, back to you. Jesse, thank you so much. Time now for a check at your morning news now weather. Joining us is meteorologist Andy Lastman with the forecast. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, ladies. Let's talk about what Jesse just said. There's more severe weather to come. The potential is there. The energy is there for that atmosphere to be charged up later this afternoon, especially. But we're already kicking things off with some thunderstorms working through parts of the plains and the Midwest. We've got some snow falling in extreme northern portions of Michigan as well as Minnesota. And some of those spots are going to pick up on some uh, snow totals, accumulating snow by the time we get through the next 24 hours. But there's the 27 million people that are included in that severe threat later today as a cold front continues making its way east. We do see places like Little Rock, Texarkana, Dallas, Austin, Houston all included in that. It goes as far south as the Gulf Coast, including parts of Louisiana and Texas, and as far north as Illinois. We will continue to see the, the highest chance for the severe weather to come in the form of hail. We're talking large hail. I'll show you exactly where here in a moment, but the damaging winds, of course, are also on the table up to 60 miles per hour. We know that can be a difficult for down trees, down power lines and such uh, as we go through the afternoon and specifically the evening hours too. The tornadoes, we could again see the isolated tornadoes developing here as we get late into the day today. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that as well. There's the areas that we have the best chance to see an inch si or an inch or higher sized hail uh, for Little Rock, St. Louis, Shreveport, Houston, places like Dallas to San Antonio. That's where we'll likely see that larger hail, two inches or even larger than that uh, as we get through this severe weather threat. Tomorrow, it diminishes just a little bit. We will still have the potential to see some of these stronger thunderstorms, so be aware of that if you live anywhere from really Brownsville all the way to Mobile uh, and as far north as Jackson, we'll see that potential. It'll mainly be the wind gust. The tornado threat is much lower for tomorrow. We, of course, won't completely rule it out, but it'll be a little bit of a break before that system heads to the east and does bring severe weather chances to folks along the east coast. There's the cold front that really is the culprit of it all. It's also bringing some of that snow to parts of the Dakota and Minnesota, as I mentioned, and it could be some of that um, accumulating snow into late April. Not great. Hopefully you didn't put those jackets away after we've had those temperature swings over the past couple of weeks, uh, but we're going to have another temperature swing here in a moment. Notice where the rain chances go tomorrow. We'll start to see those mainly focused towards the Ohio Valley and points south. Eventually, this is where it sets up just in time for your Saturday plan. So if you're going to be out and about from the mid-Atlantic down through the East Coast Saturday, you're likely going to need an umbrella and you're also going to want to stay connected when it comes to the severe weather. Little Rock, Lake Charles, Austin, all places that we could see maybe two up to three inches of rain. These are already areas that have, uh, you know, super saturated ground. So the flooding concern will remain. And we also are dealing with some river flooding in places like Fargo. So watch for that. But there's those highest totals that I mentioned up to a foot of snow in late April. I, I have a feeling people are upset about this. But nonetheless, we'll start to see that pattern change here for folks in the east. Mid 70s in Detroit, upper 80s for Washington, D.C. Norfolk ends up at 89 degrees, so not bad. Feels kind of summer-like through the day today. Mid-70s tomorrow for Hartford uh, State College. Ends up at 83. And check out Washington, D.C. tomorrow. We are running 20 degrees above normal, ladies, um, at 90 degrees. It doesn't last, though, because Saturday, upper 70s, and then we're back to the low 60s by Monday.
Angie, I'm confused. <laughs> That's why I'm here. That's what I'm you here break for. it down so well. Angie Lasman, thank you. And the Supreme Court is once again delaying its ruling on the future of abortion pills. Justice Samuel Alito extended the pause of that Texas ruling that would have severely limited access to the commonly used pill Mifepristone. The pill remains available nationwide. The justices now have until midnight on Friday to make a decision. So let's bring in Rachel Reboucher for more on this. She's dean and at James E. Beasley Professor of Law at Temple University. Rachel, good morning. So first, can you just remind us what's at stake here? This decision will not only impact women's rights, but also the way drugs are regulated in the United States, right? Absolutely. So the Texas court, the district court, and the Fifth Circuit, if those orders go into effect, it'll essentially suspend FDA approval of mifepristone. It's the first drug in a medication abortion, a set of pills people take uh, in the first trimester of pregnancy. And, um, you know, this, is, this mifepristone has been on the market for 23 years. It's been approved for 23 years. And it, it's truly unprecedented that a court could suspend FDA approval taken so long ago and over so many years. And Rachel, there's been so much legal back and forth on this. I want to back up for a moment because we know the Circuit of Appeals blocked plans laid out by the FDA to allow access to abortion pills through mail. The Justice Department is also looking to bring that ruling to the Supreme Court. Is there a scenario? Is it possible that the FDA's proposal to allow abortion pills through mail could stay even if the Supreme Court maintains Texas's move to invalidate mifepristone approval? Well, the FDA can always reassess the restrictions on mifepristone and, you know, again, lift restrictions that were in place before 2021. Essentially what the court, you know, the Fifth Circuit and the district court did is they said when the uh, FDA changed its rules and permitted people to have these pills mailed to them, um, it did so improperly. If the Supreme Court agrees, the FDA could go back through a process, lift the restriction, but that'll take time and it'll certainly create confusion. Yeah, and I mean, Rachel, separately, generic abortion pill maker Gen Biopro is actually suing the FDA over its response to stop Mifepristone's approval. Can you just walk us through that? What exactly are they arguing here? And will SCOTUS, their decision, impact this specific lawsuit at all? So one of the things that could be suspended was the approval of the generic of Mifepristone, and that's Gen Biopro, the company that manufactures that generic drug. And they're arguing, hey, please stop the FDA from enforcing any action against us if all of a sudden we're not approved. We have rights as a company and we have rights under the Constitution and we have rights per the statute that governs the FDA. So they're essentially asking a court to consider the harm they will suffer if these orders go into effect and asking the FDA to clarify that they're not going to hold uh, Gen Biopro essentially liable uh, for having an unapproved drug on the market. All right, Rachel, thanks so much for breaking that all down. Now to Texas, where an 18-year-old is in critical condition this morning after being shot. The teen, one of two cheerleaders, shot after a third friend mistakenly tried to get into the wrong car at a supermarket parking lot. Police arrested the shooting suspect, who's now in jail, charged with engaging in deadly conduct. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck is in Austin with the story. Well, Peyton Washington was just days away from the biggest cheerleading competition of the year. Her father actually telling NBC News she was wearing her cheerleading uniform when she was shot. Now, instead of joining her teammates in Orlando for the competition this weekend, she'll be recovering here in the intensive care unit. In Texas, a high school cheerleader is in critical condition this morning. After police say a man fired a gun at her and three teammates who accidentally approached the wrong car following a late night practice. The girls are going to have a long road of emotional recovery after this. Authorities arrested Pedro Tello Rodriguez Jr., charging him with deadly conduct, a third degree felony. I'm Peyton Washington on Woodlands Elite Generals. Peyton Washington is one of two teens who were shot and injured in a supermarket parking lot early Tuesday morning. Washington's father speaking out, telling NBC News the shooter showed his weapon and then, quote, just started shooting at the girls. Keelan Washington adding, you watched her walk up to your door on accident. It's a girl in a cheer outfit. 
He says the 18-year-old who was struck in her leg and back had to have her spleen removed. Peyton, who's no stranger to health challenges, having been born with one lung, earned a tumbling scholarship at Baylor University. She's extremely tough. Washington's teammate Heather Roth was grazed by a bullet in her leg, but is expected to compete this weekend in her final high school cheer competition. Tuesday's shooting in Texas, one of several making national headlines this week of young people injured or even killed for mistakenly being in the wrong place. In upstate New York, 20-year-old Kaylin Gillis was shot and killed after she turned into the wrong driveway while looking for a friend's house, according to the police. Kaylin was an amazing young lady. We all loved her so much. She was so kind. The alleged gunman Kevin Monahan was arrested and charged with second degree murder. He's pleaded not guilty. Gillis's father pleading for justice for his daughter, who he says dreamed of becoming a marine biologist. For this man to sit on his porch and fire at a car with no threat it just angers me so badly. The Woodland Elite Cheer Team has set up a GoFundMe page to help with Peyton's medical expenses. So far, it's raised more than $100,000. Back to you. Katie Beck, thank you so much. And we have new details this morning about the white man suspected of shooting black teenager Ralph Yarl in Kansas City, Missouri. Andrew Lester pleaded not guilty to two felony counts, stating he acted in self-defense. The 84-year-old allegedly shot Yarl after the teen mistakenly rang his doorbell while trying to pick up his siblings. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from the courthouse in Liberty, Missouri with the details. Maggie, good morning. Hey, St. Clay, good morning. I'll note really quickly, we have a thunderstorm going on around us, so you might hear that in the background. But yeah, as you said, we were here, we were in that courtroom yesterday as 84-year-old Andrew Lester pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. The judge, in turn, ordering him to turn over all weapons as a condition of his bond. This as Lester's ex-wife speaks out overnight about what happened and family of the boy who was shot reveals more about the depths of his pain. After nearly a week of unrest in Kansas City, the 84-year-old white homeowner charged with shooting a black teen who rang his doorbell, pleading not guilty in a Missouri courtroom. The judge yesterday ordering Andrew Lester, who used a cane and spoke softly, to turn over all weapons and have zero contact with 16-year-old Ralph Yarl. He's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. That's, that's an outcome that we're hoping for. According to court documents, Lester claimed the boy rang his doorbell and pulled the door's handle and that he thought someone was trying to break in. Justice for Ralph! Justice for Ralph! Public fury fueled by the family story that Ralph, hoping to pick up his brothers, went to the wrong home and only rang the doorbell. Moments later, shot in the head and arm. Lester's ex-wife speaking out overnight, telling the New York Times that though they haven't spoken in decades, she remembers their 14-year marriage as troubled and that he was prone to fits of rage, smashing objects in their home when he was angry. Quote, it doesn't surprise me what happened, she told the Times. Meanwhile, Ralph's recovery only beginning. A new photo shows the high school junior out of the hospital and smiling with his attorney. Though his family says the teen is struggling to process the pain of what happened, he also feels immense support from the public. He's loving the love that he's getting from everyone. He is, of course, he's not back to Ralph, but he's alive and he's healthy. You're even celebrities like Justin Timberlake and Jennifer Hudson demanding justice. A GoFundMe topping $3.3 million. A teen just starting to heal as the criminal case tied to his tragedy moves forward. And we do want to note NBC has made multiple attempts to reach Andrew Lester and as of yesterday also his new attorney. So far those attempts have been unsuccessful and that includes here yesterday at the courthouse when we were hoping to speak to Lester after his arraignment but we were told he came and went through a private secured entrance. County prosecutors say he faces the possibility of life in prison. Sinclair? Important reporting, Maggie. Thank you so much. Coming up on this hour of morning news now, UFOs, the Pentagon, and a hearing on Capitol Hill that has us asking, is the truth really out there? After the break, we'll dig into a top defense official's testimony on hundreds of mysterious incidents across the country. But are aliens to blame? Stick around.
And welcome back. The Senate held a rare open hearing on Wednesday to take a closer look at unidentified aerial phenomena, commonly known as UFOs. For more on this, we're joined by NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali. Ali, this is only the second hearing on UFOs in the past 50 years, with only one person testifying yesterday. So what were some of the key takeaways? All right, so the big takeaway, I guess, is no aliens, not yet. At least that's what the head of the Anomalies Unit is saying now. Listen to what he told senators yesterday. Arrow has found no credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology, or objects that defy the known laws of physics. In the event sufficient scientific data were ever obtained, that a UAP encountered can only be explained by extraterrestrial origin. We are committed to working with our interagency partners at NASA to appropriately inform U.S. government's leadership of its findings. So as they're looking at the hundreds of cases of unidentified objects up there, they're finding that they might not be aliens, but in most cases, they are things like balloons or drones flying up above well where they should be. Nevertheless, they do promise, at least there, that if they find that it is aliens or extraterrestrial, they'll come back and update Congress, which I think is good news for everybody, but I'm not waiting on that update. I just love that there's an anomalies unit even looking into this. Um, back in February, the government shot down a Chinese spy balloon that flew across the country. How closely is the government watching for flying objects? Well, look, that's the serious piece of this, right? Because we've watched the national security concerns right on display just over the course of the last few months as we've talked about this Chinese spy balloon. And there was a deep conversation about the roles that some of our adversaries like Russia, like China, could play in this space. Watch. Could you describe potential threat that might exist out there if they are foreign sure. nexus. There are emerging capabilities out there that, that in many instances, Russia and China, well, China in particular, are on par or ahead of us in some areas. The adversary is not waiting. They are advancing and they're advancing quickly. So this is clearly yet another frontier as we watch the different ways that our adversaries interact with us. The skies is one of the places that clearly we are looking, especially in the aftermath of the Chinese spy balloon crossing the country to the entire national consciousness just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So, Ali, what's next for the Pentagon? Should we expect more hearings from the Senate? Look, this is the second that we have seen of this nature on the Hill. I do think that there's going to be more, in part because there is a lot of interest in this, especially because if you put aside the are there aliens or not, there is a clear con there is a clear conversation happening on Capitol Hill right now about what's going on in the skies and about how it factors into national security. I do think that if and when we see more of these, they're not on the calendar yet, but as we talk to senators about this, I think that this will be much more in the national security vein. So. I would not be surprised if we saw more hearings like this going forward. Okay, fascinating stuff. Allie, thanks so much. And staying in Washington, there's growing scrutiny over President Biden's nominee for the next Secretary of Labor. Critics allege Julie Sue played a role in California's massive COVID unemployment fraud while she was in charge of the state's Labor Department. Some argue it could be a sign of how she'll handle the potential promotion. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian has the details. August 29th, 2020. L.A. rapper Nuke Bizzle raked in $700,000 from unemployment fraud and was only caught after he wrote a song about it. A Nigerian gang made off with $2 million. California prison inmates stole a billion, with some benefits even paid to convicts on death row. It was all part of a massive raid on the unemployment system in California, where Julie Su, President Biden's nominee to become the next labor secretary, was then the state's labor commissioner. The total loss now estimated at more than $30 billion. Nationwide, pandemic unemployment fraud pegged at more than $100 billion. It's the biggest fleecing of America I think we'll ever see. California was the epicenter, and critics say Su bears some responsibility. California's state audit found that your directives jeopardize the integrity of the system. Why did you take those actions? 
Why did you jeopardize the integrity of the system? Uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance program was more vulnerable to fraud. Again, it was a balance there of wanting to get money out quickly because we needed to. Um, and then once we saw the fraud, we took immediate steps. Sue was confirmed after that contentious hearing in 2021 as deputy labor secretary on a party line vote. Now, some moderate Democrats are wavering on whether to support promoting her to cabinet rank. Okay. <laughs> Critics are asking whether Sue should better answer for what happened on her watch in California and whether she's done enough in her current job to fix the nationwide problems that led to the fraud. I think she's been there for 22, 23 months. Um, what, what, what have we accomplished? Are we in a better position? And most importantly, are we in a position to deal with the next economic downturn? Uh, I fear we're not. I fear most states are not uh, because there hasn't been that coordinated leadership from, from D.C. And I John Palash ran Kentucky's unemployment system before taking a political job overseeing unemployment relief in the Trump administration. I think a lot of it has to do with... He says Sue made decisions in California that contributed to the record fraud there. He cites a January 2021 state audit, which said that California's unemployment agency under Sue waited about four months to automate a key anti-fraud measure, took incomplete action against claims filed from suspicious addresses, and removed a key safeguard against improper payments without fully understanding the significance of the safeguard. Sue has said she inherited a neglected system and responded as best she could to an unprecedented attack by organized criminal groups during the pandemic. The Labor Department under Sue has awarded hundreds of millions of dollars in grants to states to upgrade aging computer systems. Sue has said that fixing the long neglected problems will take time. I was completely shocked, upset, and like this has to be a joke. That doesn't satisfy Stephen and Gloria Clark. Documents show someone stole the couple's identity in early 2021 and made off with $30,000 in California unemployment benefits. They don't live in California. They live in Iowa. They found out when they got a notice from the IRS saying they owe nearly $4,000 in taxes. How many times would you say you tried to either call or email California's <laughs> Labor Department about your problem? Um, trying to reach out by phone, it had to be anywhere between, uh, I think, 15 to 20 times. But they got no response for months. Then the IRS deducted the money from this year's tax refund. No, I, I, I'm just hoping that, you know, California um, and even our federal government will do something, work a little bit harder to get this rectified. You know, I think, you know, those of us who live regular lives here in the United States, we, we need some we need a help our right, thanks to ken delanian for that report and sue's nomination hearing is set to begin later today turning now to a story that shows how a little kindness can go a long way yeah after being forced to tread water for nearly an hour a father and his daughter were rescued from a lake in florida thanks to the help of a good samaritan nbc news correspondent ann thompson joins us now with the details and good morning good morning this really is a remarkable story this it's a story that shows you that quick thinking a little bit of kindness um some luck and most importantly life jackets all came together to keep a situation in Tampa from becoming much, much worse. No, I don't see oh my God, I hear him. I hear him. Daylight was all but gone. We're coming! When on this Florida lake, a miraculous find. I'm going to get him in on the uh, front here. A father and daughter pulled to safety about an hour after their jet ski sunk. Their rescue captured on a deputy's body cam. I'm going to pull you by your vest, okay? It's okay. <laughs> A sunset ride on Saturday night in Baker Creek Park, northeast of Tampa, nearly tragic. When 31-year-old Christopher Snow and his 13-year-old daughter Alexis suddenly hit trouble. Alexis explained to her rescuers. Snow's girlfriend worried when she couldn't reach the pair. She tried calling both of them on their cell phones, couldn't reach either one of them and knew something had to be wrong. She told Hillsborough County Sheriff's Deputy Kevin Reich, who was on patrol. He enlisted the help of Samantha Jo Conover and her family's boat. It was nerve wracking for all of us. The team went out to find the two. My heart was just sinking and I was like, oh my gosh, like this is real. 
this is. I have chills down my back. It's it's scary. I don't think I'd ever could be able to get it out of my mind. The screams I heard from her. Once on the boat, the two were visibly exhausted. A little bit. We're tired. The moral of this story, says the sheriff, always wear your life jacket. Without a doubt, if this father and his teenage daughter wouldn't have been wearing life jackets, this would be a totally different outcome. Thanks to those life vests and teamwork, the father-daughter duo is safe. It was amazing. Like, I cried. Um, I held my husband. I cried. We would do it a thousand times again. And how lucky they are because they treaded water for nearly an hour, even with those life jackets. The father said that while he did have his life jacket on, it did not fit properly. And he wants people to always remember to wear a properly sized life jacket. It makes in a in a crisis situation, yeah. you don't have time to think about these things, and it can make all the difference. I mean, and how lucky they are. Lucky, life or death situation there. Absolutely. Ann Thompson, thank you so much. Coming up, we're gonna get this out of the way now. It's April 20th, 420. And as an ode to America's budding cannabis businesses, we're taking a closer look at the group of California activists centering pot in politics. That's up next. Welcome back. Today is April 20th, also known as 420 Day by many advocates of cannabis reform. A documentary that premiered earlier this year at the Slam Dance Film Festival in Utah sheds light on the cannabis industry here in the U.S. and the efforts to legalize marijuana, particularly in California. It's called American Pot Story Oaksterdam. Here's a sneak preview. Amsterdam became a rallying word in the minds of drug law reformers. So much change has come out of that small piece of real estate. We would, would never be as far ahead as we are in Congress. It was so revolutionary. It was such like a taboo topic. Pleased to say we're now joined by one of the filmmakers, Ravid Marcus, who is a producer and director on the project. Ravid, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, so first off, explain to us how this project came together, why this topic, and what you were hoping to accomplish. Uh, we started working on this back in 2010, and we thought we'll film a revolution in one year because we heard there's a group of people in Oakland that are trying to legalize weed. And we just thought, wow, this is incredible. And we also saw that everybody else thought they were just a joke. And we're making a lot of pot-related uh, uh, innuendos about them. And we were the only ones who thought, no, this could be serious and this might mean something. And we thought we'll just get a revolution and a film uh, out in the can in one year. And this was a lesson in civics. The measure they tried to pass in 2010 didn't uh, pass, but it ended up opening the door for all the change we see uh, in the U.S. and the world in the last decade. And because of that, uh, we ended up with a record of how change actually happens in this country. And more than anything, it's a... Um, it's a love story for the grassroots activist. Uh, and I do want to show here my little uh, friend, the dog. Uh, it's the award, the audience award that we got in Slam Dance for the film. So, uh, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations Thank on you. that. I mean, I know you spent a decade following a group of Californians for this project. As a fellow filmmaker, I know that time is precious, especially for documentaries. What were some of the things you learned along the way? Did anything surprise you? Yes, I definitely learned a lot, again, about the blood, sweat, and tears that go into uh, affecting change in this country and the sacrifices that people have to make to make it happen, both the personal ones, uh, the toll it takes on your personal life, which we definitely saw over this decade, but also uh, I learned about the, the concessions that they have to make on the way, uh, which are the reason that the policy we have today is nowhere near as perfect as they would have wanted to have, but I still saw this inspiring, hopeful story that the grassroots uh, activists can actually make things happen. It just takes this dedication that groups of people need to come together and really make it happen. And it was a sobering uh, lesson, but it also gave me a lot of hope. 
And where can people watch this film? What's next for you after this? Could there be a sequel? Yeah, well, first of all, we want this film to be seen by everyone in this country and hopefully around the world. We're looking for communities that will want to bring the film because it's a wonderful a discussion starter about uh, obviously the ramifications of the war on drugs, which was especially a war on communities of color. So there's a lot of room for discussion about uh, social justice, about this film, and about the need for prison industrial uh, complex reform and the uh, criminal justice uh, system reform. But we are excited to say that we have a few festivals lined up in the country, and especially one in your area which I very hope, uh, very much hope you to welcome uh, to mm. see with me as my guest. It's going to be on June 10th. It's going to have its New Jersey premiere at the uh, yeah. uh, Lighthouse International Film Festival in Long Beach Island on June 10th, Saturday. So please follow us uh, awesome. on social media for yeah. exact time. We'll American save the Pots. date. We definitely will. Yes. Repeat, Marcus, on this and 420. It's be another festival, so you just need to follow us on social media for updates where it's coming. Great. Audiences will stay connected. Ravit, thank you so much. In today's Climate Challenge series, there's a growing new trend of people leaving their jobs for green and climate roles. With layoffs being seen in several industries, will this be the common move among people looking for work? NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung has the story. In Seattle, architect Kristen Scott helped design the sustainable building she works in, called the Watershed. When we were designing the building, it was very much a goal of ours to improve what we could around our site. In order to be considered a living building by the city, the developer met a series of requirements. No toxic materials during construction, at least a quarter less in energy use compared to a typical building, and at least half of the stormwater collected on site to be reused throughout the building. Why go through all this? Well, I think the most important reason to go through it is that it's really prioritizing health and well-being of all of us, not only the people working in the building, but beyond the building. One of the benefits of the watershed sustainable design, attracting workers increasingly eager to work for a business that cares about the environment. Those workers, according to a new LinkedIn green job support, are reskilling as the demand for green jobs in fields like renewable energy explodes. A notable trend in an economy where overall job postings fell 14% in the past year, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You go on LinkedIn today, 18%, nearly one in five of job postings on our platform in the United States is looking for green skills. Carbon accounting up 233%, measuring drinking water quality growing by almost 190%, and energy engineering up 179%. All the while, LinkedIn says, job seekers are engaging more with companies on their green initiatives on the platform. We see much more activity amongst um, our customers and companies who are putting out content about what their climate commitments are, what their goals are, what their roadmap to getting there is. According to a recent poll, 80% of Americans from households that earn $100,000 a year or more say it's extremely important for businesses to prioritize sustainability practices and 76% say it's much more important than it was five years ago. Down the street from the watershed, Brooks Running Company says it's crucial to their business model. We recognize as a, as a brand that makes outdoor um, products that it's, it's imperative that we take action to reduce our contribution to the impacts on, on the planet. The company's headquarters are just one part of the company's efforts to reduce emissions and waste. We were looking for a new home. Sustainability was an important lens in that decision. So when we have a building like this that has these sustainability features that are ever present during the workday, that just flows through into everything else that they're doing and make sure that they're taking the part to, to achieve our sustainability targets. Our thanks to Brian Chung for that report. Yeah, and coming up, we all remember last summer's summer of bummer at airports nationwide. Widespread delays, cancellations, unbridled frustration. You get the picture. Well, this year, we're sorry to say aviation experts are expecting round two. So what's going on now and how you can stay ahead of the madness? We've got you covered. Welcome back. Time now for some financial headlines and another major retail company may be headed down the road to bankruptcy. Yeah, CNBC's Silvana now joins us with this and other financial headlines. Good morning, Silvana. 
Zinkley Valerie, good morning. That's right. So now it's Bed Bath & Beyond that may soon follow David's bridal into bankruptcy. The Wall Street Journal reports that the retailer may file for Chapter 11 as soon as this weekend. The company recently said that it needed to raise $300 million through selling stock by April 26. But Bed Bath & Beyond has warned if it can't, it would have to file for bankruptcy and likely liquidate its stores. The chain has seen sales slump in recent years as its strategy to sell more store-branded products flopped. Meanwhile, Google plans to introduce generative AI into its ad business. So generative AI is a type of technology that relies on past data to create instead of identify content. ChatGPT is a generative AI program. The Financial Times reports advertisers would be able to submit creative content such as images, video, and text related to a particular ad campaign. And Google's AI will mix the material to generate ads based on the target audience along with sales targets. And Snapchat is expanding its My AI chatbot to all of the app's users. Now, it was previously limited to subscribers of Snapchat Plus. The tool now has a few Snap-specific features. It can offer recommendations based on what's popular in the Snap map and suggest augmented reality lenses. You can also add the AI to group chats and set a custom name and avatar. For now, it can only respond with text messages, but Snap says it will soon be able to reply with its very own AI-generated art. So much so technology. We have the future, all this AI. I know. It's, <laughs> we can't keep it. It's a up. lot. I know. thank you so much. Thank sure you. Thing. And airline and aviation officials are predicting another challenging summer for travel. So what's the reason behind the busy season? Officials say it's thanks in part to the rising demand of flights and the lack of pilots. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello joins us now with more. Tom, good morning. What's going on? Yeah, good morning. You know, we all remember the chaos in America's airports last summer. Too few pilots and ground staff. Thousands of flights canceled with air passengers surging back. While the major airlines have managed to hire and train more pilots, the nation's regional airlines are warning they are facing an acute shortage of pilots. And that could threaten service to small airports nationwide. And this summer could be a record breaker. Countdown to the summer getaway, and don't expect an open middle seat. It's shaping up to be another season of crowded airports and packed planes. Good morning. How you doing? I'm good. The head of the TSA tells Bloomberg the agency is preparing for a record number of air passengers throughout the summer, comfortably above pre-pandemic numbers. With airports in Orlando, Dallas, Houston, and East Coast hubs all expected to be the busiest. With demand surging, American Airlines is joining Delta and United in temporarily cutting back some flights into New York airports, citing air traffic controller shortages. It follows a nationwide pilot shortage, which has been easing in recent months as the major carriers ramp up hiring and training. Still, many regional airlines are struggling to find enough pilots, as some in the industry call for changing pilot qualification and training standards to address the shortage. The head of the Airline Pilots Association says that is a non-starter. This is no time to weaken safety standards. We visited United's Flight Training Center in Denver last year, where the airline trains new and veteran pilots around the clock. You're hitting the wind shear a little bit, so. Yep. All right, wind shear going around. The FAA requires pilots to go through simulator training every nine months, honing their skills and preparing for the unlikely emergency. Meanwhile, pressure is building on Southwest Airlines after that technical glitch on Tuesday caused nearly 2,500 airline flights to be delayed. Southwest says data connection issues were to blame. But it follows its meltdown last December when outdated systems led to more than 16,000 of its flights being canceled, 2 million passengers stranded. So what can you do to prepare for travel this summer? Given the flights are already filling up, experts say buy your tickets now. Hopper.com reports domestic summer airfares will be nearly 18% more expensive than in 2019 pre-pandemic. Back to the pilot shortage at the regional airlines. You know, there's been talk of raising the mandatory retirement age from 65 to 67, but the unions and most airlines oppose that. There's also been talk of lowering the number of required hours pilots must have to be a commercial pilot. 
but there's not much support for that either. So this is really a great time for young people to learn how to fly, get a career. Several airlines have opened academies to funnel those young candidates right into the cockpit. Sinclair? So interesting. The travel drama continues. Tom Costello, thank you so much. We have an update this morning on Tiger Woods' condition after he just revealed he underwent ankle surgery. Comes after he was forced to withdraw from the Masters tournament earlier this month. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung has more on this. Hey there, it's just the latest surgery for Tiger after that 2021 car crash nearly cost him his right leg. His comeback last year was nothing short of miraculous. And as much as golf fans love to see him make his 23rd consecutive cut at the Masters this year, it was hard to watch him struggle just to walk the course. Now there is no timeline for when or if we'll see him tee it up again. Tiger Woods future on the golf course in jeopardy after another surgery on his ankle. The golf legend sharing on Twitter that he underwent surgery Wednesday in New York to address post-traumatic arthritis from a previous ankle fracture. Orthopedic surgeon Dr. Vonda Wright, who did not treat Woods, says it can take at least three months to heal under the best of circumstances. Subtalar fusions are usually done with very large screws, not unlike the diameter of this pen. Woods saying he's now recovering and looking forward to rehabilitation, which experts say can take up to a year. Now we won't have as much flexibility front and back, but most importantly, side to side. And look at a golf course. You can't go anywhere in a golf course without uneven ground and needing side to side motion. Woods last teed off at the Masters earlier this month. The difficulty for me is going to be the walking going forward. But it wasn't easy for him on the grounds of Augusta National. The five-time Masters winner visibly in pain, limping across the course. Woods pulled out of the tournament in the third round, then tweeting that he re-aggravated his plantar fasciitis. Tiger Woods' injury history is almost as long as his championship history. By our count, he is now in double digits in terms of surgery, and those are the ones that we know of. Since that horrific car crash shattered his right leg two years ago, Tiger's been in the biggest fight of his career to return to form. I'm lucky to be alive, but also still had the limb. I think he's confronting both reality and mortality. I think he recognizes what's going on here. Nobody knows more than he does how difficult this has been for him to do. Just weeks ago, the 47-year-old reflected on his journey and when it might come to an end. Does it ever cross your mind this could be the last time? Yes, it has. I don't know how many more I have in me. And our NBC Sports golf analyst Jimmy Roberts pointed out to me that Tiger's currently tied for the most PGA Tour wins of all time. All he needs is one win to own that record. And Jimmy said he'd imagine that's got to be very meaningful for Tiger to pursue. Now it seems unlikely he'll be able to play in a major championship this year, but Tiger has spent a lifetime defying people's expectations. Back to you. All right, we'll be watching. Kaylee, thanks so much. Coming up, the wind is shifting around popular music in America, and Latin artists like Bad Bunny and Peso Pluma are at the forefront of that change. That's right. From Billboard's top 10 to Coachella's biggest stage, their influence on our culture and streaming accounts is undeniable. After the break, a quick history of how they got here. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The Foo Fighters are gearing up to release their first album since the sudden passing of drummer Taylor Hawkins. The band announced yesterday that their 11th album called But Here We Are will be released in June. They also shared their lead single titled Rescued along with the album's full track list and artwork. The band says the album focuses on healing, especially after Hawkins' death last year. But Here We Are will include 10 tracks and is set to be released on June 2nd. They say music is healing, and I imagine this album will be too. Valerie. Sinclair, thank you for that. Uh, from the first Mexican song to reach the top 10 on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 to Bad Bunny making history as the first Spanish-language performer to headline Coachella, it's been an incredible year for Latin artists. Guad Venegas gives us a closer look at just how much the genre has grown and the impact it's having on listeners everywhere. Bella, ella sabe que está buena. It's a sound the Billboard Top 10 had never heard before. The song Ella Baila Sola from breakout singer Peso Pluma, which is smashing glass ceilings, becoming the first regional Mexican song ever to hit Top 10 in the U.S. Billboard Top 100.
Just days ago, Peso Pluma taking on one of the biggest stages at Coachella, joining another giant, Becky G. The Mexican singer has become the latest global sensation in a wave of Latin artists breaking records never seen before and also cashing in. In 2022, Latin music revenue surged 24%, exceeding $1 billion for the first time, outpacing the broader music industry. Last year, around $13 billion hours of live music were streamed on Spotify. Bad Bunny set the world record last year, surpassing Ed Sheeran for the highest grossing tour in a calendar year, amassing 435 million across 81 shows. Around six tracks of the top 20 global tracks right now on Spotify are Musica Mexicana tracks. So not only within Latin music, it's been an incredible few years, and this year uh, it's just moving on to new heights, but Musica Mexicana, we see it growing uh, in, in a huge way. In a for three years, he has held the titles as the most dream artist on Spotify. The Puerto Rican megastar making history this weekend as the first Spanish language performer to headline Coachella. And then there's Carol G, the first female singer to score a number one album in the U.S. with an album entirely in Spanish, leading with her hit song Te Quedo Grande. It's just almost impossible to ignore anymore, especially a guy like Bad Bunny, like who's dominating world popular music. You know, we can't really have our head in the sand anymore and ignore this, the fact that the folks who are listening to the, the music is not just Latino, it's multiracial, it's multi, there are a lot of different ages, there's a lot of different demographics that fit into the people who are listening to Bad Bunny. From the clubs to Coachella with Latin music dominating the charts, you'll be sure to hear Spanish on your summer playlists. Guad Venegas, NBC News, Miami. From the clubs to Coachella. So cool. We love to hear that. Thank you, Quad. Well, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.